Hello, welcome back. I'm Masood Raja, and today I am going to embark on a perilous journey, and that is I will be recording a series of lectures on Gayatri Spivex, Can the Subaltern Speak? A lot of people have asked me for it, but I've been reluctant to do that because, to be honest, I think I probably do not have the wherewithal to deal with Spivex work, but I'll give it a try anyway. This particular lecture is an introductory lecture that sets the stage for other parts of this lecture. And here I would like to point out that this particular essay was an occasional essay, just like an occasional poem. Why was it an occasional essay? Because Spivak was responding to an interview by Deleuze and Foucault. I mean, it's very obvious in the first two or three pages of the essay that she is doing that. Now, I have a copy of that interview on my website and I'll post a link to it, but maybe let's see. And the essay was, the interview was published as Intellectuals in Power. And I can see if I can share the screen to show it to you. So here it is, intellectual and power, intellectuals and power, and uh, it's an interesting uh, essay because the questions that are being asked of uh, Deleuze and Foucault are the and the answers that they give is what Spivak is responding to. Okay. But there is a moment in this interview where Deleuze mentions, and remember, Deleuze and Foucault had just come out of the prison reform protests, right? And what Deleuze is, says at one point in the essay that representation, there is no signifier anymore. Representation is no longer needed because people can speak for themselves because they had learned in their experiences that the prisoners exactly knew through their lived experiences as to what kind of reform they wanted. So the role of the intellectual was not to speak on their behalf or represent them, but to learn from the people through their lived experiences and then become a relay between the prisoners and the rest of the world and the powers that be. So it's a role of intellectual that is at play and a sort of assertion that we as intellectuals no longer need to represent the people. Okay. Now, assumption behind that is that people can speak for themselves, right? So the main question in Can the Subaltern Speak, if you read it through and through after you have waded through theory, Derrida and Marx and everyone else, is whether or not the post-colonial intellectual can assume that the subaltern subjects can speak for themselves and hence abdicate his or her responsibility of representation, of speaking for, right? that kind of representation because Spivak distinguishes between two kinds of representations, standing in for in the artistic representation. We'll talk about that more. Now in this interview then, first of all, it's two Western intellectuals talking about Maoism. So the first um, objection that Spivak have is, okay, here are these two European intellectual using the term Maoism, but which is very Eurocentric. You can't trace the original Maoism in it. It is the French version of Maoism. Then in the process of giving this interview, right, they are also unannouncedly, right, inhabiting this subjectivity, this privileged European subjectivity not conscious of the global division of labor, okay? Not worried about it at all because they are imagining their own experience as universal, right? And Spivak finds a problem with that as well. So her argument in the very beginning is that this interview while critiquing the subject in, inaugurates a new subject of the West, right? 
that there is no understanding of a general theory of ideology and global division of labor when these scholars are making their claims and that without that you can't talk about the global periphery right where things are happening so it's very eurocentric and most importantly why is it essential for the intellectual to not to give up on his or her responsibility to represent okay and hence can the subaltern speak the question is can we abdicate our responsibility by simply assuming that the subalterns have obtained political voice and we don't need to be in solidarity with them or represent them? That's the question that she's trying to answer. Now, also keep in mind that Spivak did revise this essay. A lot of people don't go and read it. And it's interwoven with her essay on Rani F. Simur in her book, a critique of post-colonial reason and on one of the pages you know she acknowledges that while talking about you know her earlier essay and talking about how uh, Bobanswari is still misrepresented by her own relatives she writes and I quote I was so unnerved by this failure of communication that in the first version of this text, which is Can the Subaltern Speak, I wrote in the accents of passionate lament, the subaltern cannot speak. It was an inadvisable remark. Right. So the revision is there. Now, she doesn't retract that idea that the subaltern cannot speak within the context of Deleuze and Foucault um, interview. But that correction is there. Right. And she acknowledges the work of people who criticize the essay by saying, can the subaltern vote? Right. But all of it is contingent upon our understanding of subalternity itself. Right. Here, Spivak in the original essay used a sort of strategic essentialism. That was her term, that the subaltern is a subaltern because he or she cannot speak, right? And if we assume that as intellectuals, as scholars, then we can take on the responsibility of working with the subalterns. Now, remember, in another uh, one of her works, uh, Spivak you know, articulates what is the role of humanities. It's in the first chapter of Other Asia's, her other book. And she says that, you know, the role of humanities, one role is to train the imagination of our students at both ends of the global divide, to teach our students over here how to think the world and to teach the students in the global periphery the habits and the ideas and the knowledge of democracy. So this is just my introductory lecture. I'll delve into the essay, of course, later, but I thought I should explain that she's responding to Deleuze and Foucault and certain claims that they make within the essay and the lack of a general theory of ideology in their essays, the European subjectivity that both of them uncritically inhabit, right? The Western version of Maoism. And then the main question, can we assume that people can speak for themselves? And if we do as post-colonial scholars, what is at stake? So this is the first lecture and I will come back with more. Hope you all will join me. And if you like this uh, kind of work and what I offer, please do subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much. And I will see you next time. Peace and love. Hello, welcome back. Today I'm going to attempt to record the second part of my lecture on Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? Now in the first part I had explained that this is an occasional essay and Spivak is responding to an interview by Deleuze and Foucault and that she has certain objections to some of the things that Deleuze and Foucault state. Today I'm going to use and try to use the text of the essay itself and try to go line by line and see if I can handle the first part of the essay. Now, uh, 
you are aware that there are four parts of the essay. Essay is uh, organized. There are four parts. Part one is a critique of the Foucault Deleuze interview, which I hope to cover in this lecture. Part two describes epistemic violence, the subaltern, and ends with the words on implications uh, of what will happen if we actually bought into what Deleuze and Foucault say and followed it as intellectual. Part three, she moves us into a discussion of Derrida in comparison to Foucault, because people often argue, she says, that Foucault writes about history and Derrida is ahistorical. What she's arguing is that the tools that Derrida gives us are actually more significant for people doing scholarship about the global periphery. And that's what she argues in part three. And the part four is kind of the meat of the her argument because she takes us through the discussion of sati, its codification under the colonial law and the towards her final example of Buon Sawari and her suicide, right? These are the four parts of the essays. And at each stage, when I move from one part to the other, I'll try to explain as to why is she moving into a certain thought process, okay? But first and foremost, I would like to point out in this lecture, her main argument in the beginning of the essay and her main objections to the interview and why does she choose the interview? That's the intent in this part and I hope I can do justice to it. And if you just look at the first line, you know, it tells us the whole project of this essay because what she starts with is that some of the most radical criticism coming out of the West today is the result of an interested desire to conserve the subject of the West or West as a subject. Let's unpack that. So this role played by the intellectuals maybe unintentionally ends up preserving the subject of the Western intellectual or West itself without any acknowledgement of the complicating factors coming from the developing world. So the idea is that the Western intellectual in the process of explaining things that could be relevant to the workers is actually constituting their own location in the West as normative and as maybe the only normative universal way of looking, looking at it without even knowing that they are doing that. The much publicized critique of the sovereign subject, she's talking now, thus actually inaugurates a subject. Okay, so the critique of the sovereign subject is a Foucauldian thing, right? He is the one who talks about that we don't act as subjects, but we produce subject effects. So the prophet of subject effects, Foucault, while talking about this particular subject in the interview, himself is inaugurating, you know, a new subject of the West. And what does she argue? She says, I will argue for this conclusion by considering a text by two great practitioners. So, so this general tendency to create West as the subject and the Western intellectual as the speaking subject, as the norm, she says, I will now read, I will now prove this point by reading an interview by two scholars who are the prophets so-called of the periphery, right? Foucault and Deleuze. And then she gives us the reason why she has chosen an interview instead of their long, you know, well thought out and planned works. She says, I have chosen this friendly exchange between two activist philosophers of history because it undoes the opposition between authoritative theoretical production and the unguarded practice of conversation, right? Thus enabling Spivak and others to trace the working of ideology, right? So the idea is 
that she's not reading their finished projects, which would be more deliberate and maybe would have less slippage of the ideology that has produced those two scholars. But to take this conversation, maybe informal, because it is informal and that informality allows a scholar like Spivak to read into it as to what is it that these two scholars are expressing ideologically without even knowing as to where their assumptions are coming from. It's like when she discusses later tracking the silences of the text, right? Foucault and Deleuze are not saying this is who we are. They're expressing it. The ideology is showing through that informal expression through a conversation. OK, so then she goes on and tells us about the critique of the sovereign subject, of which, of course, Foucault is a part. But she says that there are two things that come across very clearly in this interview, right? That this is a conversation with the Maoists. And another thing that comes up in this conversation is the workers' struggle, right? Now. Obviously, in this discussion with the French Maoists, what Spivak points out is that you can't trace the original Maoism in it. It's French Maoism, which has got nothing to do with Maoism coming from China. And it eventually becomes French new philosophy. And that these two scholars are also connecting their views to workers' struggle, which she says is a genuflection on the part of Deleuze. And why does she say that? Um, she quotes Deleuze here. She says, we are unable to touch power in any points of its application without finding ourselves confronted by this diffuse mass, mass so that we are necessarily led to the desire to blow it up completely. Every partial revolutionary attack or defense is linked in this way to the workers' struggle. Right. And Spivak says this is probably not sincere because it's like a genuflection. She's talking about the workers' struggle, but they don't connect it to the actual workers' struggle in the world because in order to do that, these two intellectuals will have to incorporate in their thought process the global division of labor that the workers' struggle is not uniform in France as well as in India and Bangladesh, right? That there is a global division of labor, right? And there are workers on the other end of the global divide who are caught within the web of capital, who are exploited, who has have not gotten a chance of upward mobility to become part of the consumerist economy, right? And there is no way we can conflate the workers that Deleuze and Foucault are imagining with the workers on the other end of the global divide. So for these two scholars to make these claims, there is then an erasure of ideology itself that we cannot talk about the worker struggle without a general theory of ideology and within that, without actually understanding the global division of labor. Now then she goes on on the next pages, and I'm trying to bring the next page uh, here is, uh, she gives us a further critique of what Deleuze and Foucault are arguing. And one of the things that they argue is that uh, in their interview is that theory is practice and practice is theory, right? And there is no signifier. What Spivak is then asking the question is that if that is so, right, and if desire leads us and it doesn't lack anything according to Deleuze, right, it's not lack of its object, it is rather the subject that's lacking desire, right, that entire theory of desire by um, Deleuze. So how do you then track the presence of the West's other in that theory of desire. So what she's saying here is this may be the legal subject of socialized capital, neither labor nor management holding a strong passport 
using a strong or hard currency with supposedly unquestioned access to due process. It is certainly not the desiring subject as other. So, so the, the other or the desiring subject that Deleuze is theorizing and talking about cannot necessarily be universalized. And it certainly cannot be the desiring subject as the other, right? Because that subject cannot move about in the world with the freedom and facility in which the subject that Deleuze is theorizing moves about, right? We have to understand the existence of the other, and we can only understand it if we think of ideology and think of the global division of labor. Okay. Uh, furthermore, she goes into, uh, you know, there is a certain disavowal of ideology in the interview. But the question that she's also asking is the question about representation and that she brings up on page 71, okay? And they, then she says that, okay, at one point, Deleuze's argument is that, um, you know, there is no more representation. And I'm quoting is there is nothing but action, action of theory and action of practice which relate to each other as relays of networks, right? And what Deleuze is arguing is that the intellectual becomes transparent, right? And a relay, people know what they want. They relay to the intellectual and the intellectual relays it forward, right? There is, Spivak is saying, there is not even a critical understanding of what is being relayed. The, the critic has taken away that role itself, right? But then she goes into and saying, OK, what kind of representation are they talking about? If they are saying there is no representation, right? There are two possible definitions of representation. And those are Voltraiton, right? Represent in the first sense, right? Where you stand in for someone, you represent someone, maybe politically and other. And then there are stale right? Representation in pictorial form, in art, right? And what she is saying is that you can't think that they both are the same, right? And in order for us to understand the global division of labor, we have to be very careful in defining what do we even mean by representation. And obviously, she takes us to Mark, Marx, because he's the one who's theorizing class, right? And class to him is people who share the same kind of lived experience but are cut off from other classes. But class is never natural, right? It, it is constructed because of the socioeconomic conditions in which people exist. And if we are talking about representation of class, it will be Vertraiton, right? Someone standing in for them. And she goes to, you know, the famous essay, the 18th Boromir of Louis Bonaparte, where Marx discussing the question of class, right? And uh, especially for the Jewish citizens of France. And then in this part one, after she had discussed, and the reason she's discussing Marx here is because she's giving us how Marx theorizes class and that that understanding of class is crucial. And the distinction between two kinds of representations is crucial if Deleuze and Foucault are going to argue that representation has withered away, right? Um, so further in this part, towards the end of it, you know, uh, what she says is, and I, I quote, she says, my view is that radical practice should attend to this double session of representation. It should know about world freedom, but also does trail, right? And Marx himself, she says, rehearses an ancient subterfuge in the concept of uh, what that what Marx himself rehearses, and that post-structuralists by erasing these this distinction, right? Then then they can claim there is no sign structure operating experience, and 
Does that mean she says we lay semiotics to rest? If there is no need of representation, right? What kind of representation is it? But then what is the role of the intellectual, right? Then she, on page 75 of my text, she goes on to discuss Said, right? And Said's insistence and critique of Foucault, where Said basically is talking about the importance of the intellectual and his or her role, right? And, and, and the reason she's taking us to Said is to assert that the intellectual should not abdicate his or her role of representing, especially the other of your, right? Um, and then what will happen? She uses the term other as the self's shadow. I shall return to this argument short, shortly, she says, but uh, but this, if these French intellectuals can claim that representation has withered away, it has died, right? The people can speak for themselves and they can offer these solutions normatively and almost universally, right? What is at stake? First of all, that the intellectuals need not to represent the people, represent in standing in for, right? And two, that everyone is constructed in the shadow of this self that is speaking, right? Right? And so the, the other of Europe then is constructed in the shadow of this European self, right? And if we do that, then we have to elide this entire lopsided global division of labor. And can we actually do that, right? That's her question in this part, that if we assume that representation is no longer necessary or no longer needed, what kind of representation are we talking about? If we are saying that the desire leads a person to the interest where it lies, Whose desire are we talking about? Does this desire include the desire of the global other of Europe, the person on the other end of global divide, right? And that if we leave this question unattended, aren't we creating the other of Europe in its own shadow without even knowing that it could have a different subjectivity, a different existence, a different politics, right? So the question then, at the end of this section, it, it is what she's saying is that let's query into that, right? Let's question the question of a general ideology, global division of labor, and let's question the claims that these intellectuals are making on the plane of class, but also global division of labor in which the views of these two privileged European intellectuals that are being offered as definitive stance on representation and signification and role of the intellectuals, what would be at stake if we, I mean, the developing world intellectuals, the third world intellectuals, the post-colonialists, uncritically bought into it and believed that people or subalterns can speak for themselves and there is no need for us to represent them. So that is the groundwork that she is laying down in part one of Can the Subaltern Speak, right? And now, you know, I know I've not done a good job of <laughs> explaining it, but I was trying to go line by line. So with this brief knowledge and my Conclu concluding thoughts on it, we will then move on to part two of the essay, as I explained, and see if we can understand her argument better, right? How does she make her point? Remember, she's trying to prove in the very beginning of this essay that in the process of discussing the subject, a new practice is happening in post-structuralism, and that is the solidification of the subject of Europe and Europe as a subject itself. The interview that is using is an example of how it happens. And the critique is why is it necessary to challenge that creation of 
Europe as a subject or the subject of Europe as an intellectual. I hope this was helpful to you and I'll soon come back with part three of my um, attempt at trying to discuss can the subaltern speak. Until then, thank you so much and peace and love. I'm back again with uh, my third lecture on Spivax, Can the Subaltern Speak? Now, if you have watched my previous two lectures, the first was an introduction to the background materials, especially to the Foucault Deleuze interview that Spivak is responding to. In the second lecture, I explained the organization of the essay and then covered part one in which Spivak lays out her arguments against certain statements that Deleuze and Foucault make. In this section of my series of lectures, I'll be talking about part two of the essay. And uh, it's a very important part because this is where she elaborates on the groundwork that she had done previously. Okay. And here is where she ends um, the first part of the, the last paragraph of part one is, uh, and I'm going to share it on a larger screen so that you can watch it. Uh, what she shares it, here is the last paragraph of the part one. And it says, however reductionist and economic analysis, uh, these intellectuals forget at their own peril that the entire overdetermined enterprise was in the interest of a dynamic economic situation. So this is Spivak basically suggesting to Foucault and Deleuze, Deleuze and the readers of that interview is that as they are talking about that there is no longer representation, what they are forgetting is that the system, right, which remains unannounced in their saying was colonialism and colonialism was a system that generates and creates certain epistemology, right, and creates the other of Europe. Right? The question is, how is the other of Europe created and stabilized? Right. So the main project of colonialism for Spivak was that epistemologically and through other policies, through law, the colonies were created as a subject or as a space as other of Europe right, as the dark shadow of Europe against which Europe could exist as a more civilized or uh, a so-called more organized civilization, right? So the next thing that she talks about, she on the next page, she goes on to explaining what she means. This is the beginning of part two, what she means by epistemic violence. Right? And she starts with the clearest available example of such epistemic violence is the remotely orchestrated, far-flung and heterogeneous project to constitute the colonial subject as other. Right, And she will dwell on this in part two. Okay, so the colonial subject as other is absolutely necessary for the colonial system to exist because Europeans must cre create this other in order to sustain their own identity, uh, identities. And within that, while referring to Foucault, she's saying, okay, there is a lecture by Foucault, remember in one of his lecture series towards the end of his career when he starts giving public lectures where Foucault talks about buried knowledges, right? Uh, the unacknowledged knowledge and the role of the intellectual. Or otherwise, our job is to, what if we could bring out that knowledge and juxtapose it with, it, with the scientific knowledge or with knowledge that claims to be normative, right? And Foucault calls this buried knowledge as bruised knowledge. And the purpose is to bring it face to face with the mainstream knowledge and its scientificity, and then complicate the discursive world that that established knowledge has created, right? And she's saying, okay, Mr. Foucault, right? Uh, 
let's read this constitution of colonial subject as other. Let's read it within the paradigm of your own theory of, uh, you know, uh, this knowledge that doesn't form part of your or Deleuze's perception or background. But can we retrieve that knowledge and talk about it? And can we do ret retrieve the acts of epistemic violence and how they structure the colonial system and how we can track their presence even now as these two intellectuals are speaking about workers' struggle as a universal struggle within its Eurocentricity. So how does then she trace that epistemic violence, right? She goes to one aspect of how the British kind of codified their presence in India, right? And that is through codification of Hindu law, right? So she says, let us consider briefly the underpinnings of the British codification of Hindu law, right? While she's doing that, she also once again criticizes Foucault and Deleuze's insistence on the concrete experience, right, as the chief arbiter of truth. Now, remember, in their interview, Foucault and Deleuze are saying, hey, we worked with these prisoners. And most of the times, the prisoners, their bodies were experiencing the jails, right? And they knew their own condition. And they told us what they wanted, right? So they were they are privileging concrete experience over theory or over a theoretical understanding of the world. And what, through Marx, what Spivak is saying is, what is at stake if we privilege simply that concrete experience itself in its pure form can inform the people of their living conditions, right? That there is no ideology that is tracked in there, that, that, that what, what, the, what the insistence on concrete experience then suggests is contra altusser, that we can exist outside of ideology and somehow can touch the real, right? And that's why she inserts here too, is why she is suspicious of concrete experience as the chief arbiter of truth, right? And then she also, now remember, you can't skim Spivak, right? And Spivak is a very careful scholar. She doesn't leave you many places to point out where she doesn't cover her own statements, doesn't provide a justification for them. So she knows that she is going to the an Indian example. How did the British codify the Hindu law? But she also knows, and she says so in this part, that in, in North America, because of the culturalist emphasis, people might think, oh, here she goes again, you know, giving us examples from her cultural specificity from India. And she, what her reason is, she says, look, I wasn't trained in the West. I got most of my education in India. And the reason I go to Indian materials, one of the reasons is that, you know, that's what I know the best. But what she's also clarifying is that she doesn't go there in a nativist way to prove that somehow the Indian materials are better. And she also clarifies in this section that what she's going to talk about the codification of Hindu law within the colonial episteme of violence or epistemic violence, even in post-colonial studies, is not generalizable to other colonized parts of the world. So she's very specific. And she's also teaching us in the process that we should not take her insights and apply them ipso facto as universal truth to all the colonial situations, right? And she's very carefully pointing that out over here. And we ought to keep that in mind. So uh, then she explains to us the complexity of Hindu law, right? How did it work? So it had a four part episteme Sruti, Smithri, Sastra, and, uh, and Vyavahara, right? I hope I'm saying them right. So it was first, you know, whether uh, a tradition or a custom was it heard 
Was it remembered? Was it learned from another? And was it performed in exchange? These are the four levels on which the Hindu sacred texts were read and interpreted, right? So when the British codify the Hindu law, the question that she is posing is, do they simplify it, you know, according to their own meaning making processes, or are they aware of this subtlety and this complexity within the Hindu tradition itself of how things are interpreted, how laws are made. Now she will eventually go on to discuss it further, but in this part, what she's talking about is how is the colonial subject cre created as Europe's other. So a summary of that is, is the British treatment of sati, which is called widow immolation, right? And what she's arguing, and she will further clarify it in another section, is that codification of Hindu law, according to British, British especially the practice of sati, it was flattened so that what people in England could think of was, oh, here, look at these people. They burn the widows on their altar, right? And that codification in the Indian context, then the, that is the first major legislation announced by it, you will not burn widows, right? But it creates this image of India, of Hindus, right? as these people, why are we there? Oh, we will not let them burn the widows anymore. So it, it represents this idea, the practice of sati as inscribed in Hindu scripture and as rampant everywhere, right? And Spivak eventually explains to us, I mean, it was not practiced so widely. It was mostly upper class women. Um, also, there were other forms of self emulation like a thing, a practice called Johar, which the Rajputs practiced, my people. And Spivak is also critical of the native, uh, you know, Hindu nationalist who proposed that as this valor, act of valor, or this idea from the native culture coming that maybe the widows did want to kill themselves, right? But the codification of Hindu law, she also points out, I think in the next part also, is that there is an ambivalence even in the sacred texts, right? And I will cite that verse where she goes and that the interpreters of the sacred texts misread that. But then the British are also misreading this practice, right? And, and under the garb of saving the widows from brown men, right? White men saving brown women from brown men the codification flattens the understanding of sati, but then also creates this Indian other, which can be reduced to a European audience. And so it becomes part of the project of, you know, colonialism project in a sense that now they can justify on one other account, this is what we are trying to do in India. I mean, people kill widows, right? They burn them at the altar. Now think of that argument, white men saving brown women from brown men has been mobilized so many times in our own lifetimes, invasion of Iraq, invasion of Afghanistan, right? Just remember before the U US invasion of Afghanistan, what were we seeing? on CNN, I remember this entire show on women clad in burqas, right? What the Taliban were doing to them, right? And so the narrative maybe unannounced was these are the women we are trying to liberate, saving them from brown men, not realizing that during the Clinton admi administration before Bush, United States was working with the Taliban while they were committing all those atrocities. And they, the, the Clinton administration officials at times gave a culturalist defense of the Taliban that we they need to do what they need to do within the logic of their own culture. That that was happening under the 
power of America and their connected interest with a stable Afghanistan. Same with Iraq, right? When Bush, Mr. Bush wants to go and liberate Iraqi people, this was the same Saddam Hussein who was implanted by United States. But suddenly the narrative there is also to save brown women from brown men. But if you look at the U.S. interests abroad, Saudi Arabia is a great example of it. No one wants to go and liberate Saudi women, right? Um, but the narrative, this narrative, she will talk about it a little more uh, further of white men saving brown women and codification of Hindu sati laws was a great example of that, how the British saw it, how they represented it, and how they legislated it. But part of that legislation was to create this other whom you are trying to control by law, right? Also, um, she goes on then to, you know, the question of, from there, she is taking us now to, to the question of the subaltern itself. Because remember, the essay's title is, Can the Subaltern Speak? Right? And on page 78, she poses this question. And this is posed to Foucault and Deleuze, who are arguing that the subaltern, the people, can speak for themselves. And she's saying, OK, after this colonial epistemic violence, of which you don't account for or say nothing about, we must now confront the following question. On the other side of the international div division of labor from socialized capital, right? This is what she had pointed out, that there is a global division of labor. Inside and outside the circuit of the epistemic violence of imperial law and education, supplementing an earlier economic text, can the subaltern speak? The earlier economic text being, I think, the Marxist understanding of economy. But she says, you guys are saying that the subaltern can speak, right? You're universalizing it. But if we read the figure of the subaltern within the international division of labor, right, without the ability to become part of the mainstream economy through consumerization, right? Let's see, can the subaltern speak, right? She locates this subaltern figure, right? As she's already told us, she's going to go to India. Right? And then she provides us a discussion of the subaltern studies group, right? Now, subaltern studies collective arguably is one of the most prominent group of historians and writers who have produced about 10 volumes of works who argue that the Indian national historiography is too elite centric. And that they go and retrieve the silenced histories of the subaltern groups, right? And in the process of doing so, she gives on one of the pages a gradation of subaltern groups that they create, right? And what happens in creating those lists of subaltern groups is that a group can be a subaltern group in one region and be a dominant group in, a, in another region, right? And also in the process, they are assuming a, some sort of an essentialized subaltern subject, right? And Spivak provides us quite a lot of detail about the subaltern studies project. Um, and I'm quoting here from page 80, she says that the regional and local levels, the dominant integer, if belonging to social strata hierarchically inferior to those of the dominant all Indian groups still acted in the interest of the latter and not in conformity to the interest corresponding truly to their own social being. So when these writers speaks in their essentializing language, she's talking about the subaltern studies group of a gap between interest and action in the intermediate group. Now, this is a group that's neither dominant nor subaltern. It's in between, right? And they're speaking of where their interest lies, which is a Marxian reading of interest, right? Their conclusions are closer to Marx. 
marks, right? Because like, let's say when Marx defines where would the petite bourgeois fall. So in the last instance, he thinks that their interest would lie with the proletariat. Right. So they are theorizing, even though they are essentializing the subaltern groups or someone, who, someone who is in between, and they realize that their interest is still connected to the dominant group. They are theorizing it not through desire, but through their class interest. Right. What she's saying is, Marx then to the self conscious naivete of Deleuze's pronouncement on the issue which he says, you know, people can speak for themselves. Guha, that is Ranajit Guha, like Marx, speaks of interest in terms of the social rather than desire, rather than the libidinal being. The name of the father imagery in the 18th Boromir can help to emphasize that. Remember, she has already discussed Marx and how the Jewish citizens whom Louis Napoleon had given the citizenship rights claim Napoleon to be the father figure so that he could represent themselves. That's the name of the father. Uh, so what she is saying here is that the subaltern studies group, even though they essentialize the subaltern and, and do sometimes refer to the pure consciousness of the subaltern, subaltern, which is a question whether that can be retrieved and represented, their articulation of subaltern's interest is materialistic and Marxist, right? And maybe more useful to us within the colonial context than assuming that their desire leads them to their interest, as Deleuze suggests, right? Next, she moves on to so. So after she has done this, right, um, after she has theorized the subaltern and discussed the subaltern studies group, what she proposes at the end of this section, and I'm going to go there, is, and I'm going to read it. Um, she again criticizes Foucault, but before that she gives, you know, um, an account of how to do materialistic readings. But towards the end of section two, she suggests, and I read, sometimes it seems as if the very brilliance of Foucault's analysis of the centuries of European imperialism produces a miniature version of that heterogeneous phenomena, management of space, but by doctors, development of administrations, but in the asylums considerations of the periphery, but in the terms of the insane prisoners and children, the clinic, the asylum, the prison, the university, all seem to be screen allegories that foreclose a reading of the broader narratives of imperialism. Right? One could open a sm similar discussion of the fact ferocious motives of deterritorialization, ter that is a dig at Deleuze. Yet we have already spoken of the sanctioned ignorance that every critic of imperialism must chart. So before she gets to this conclusion and moves on to part three, right, where she talks about Derrida, the account that she gives us is then um, of the I mean, there's a critique of pure consciousness. I, sorry, I'd missed these slides. Um, she talks about also reading the silences of her text, right? And this comes from Pierre McCary. Uh, it's not what a text doesn't say, but any text, Deleuze and Foucault's text, let's say their interview, reading the silences of the text isn't that what they refuse to say, but it would be what they take for granted. Right, what they think that the listeners or readers will be privy to, right? And actually, a brilliant example of reading the sciences, uh, silences of a text is also um, uh, Althusser's uh, reading uh, about reading Marx, right? Reading Capital, where he talks about, okay, I'm going to read in this what Marx doesn't explain, what he takes for granted as something that everyone would be privy to. So here, 
Um, through Pierre McCary, what she's suggesting is that the, the reading, the silences of Deleuze and Foucault's interview is, is the things that they do not say. And the main thing that they do not say is the history of imperialism, right? And the current regime of imperialism, which is America-centric, right? And within that, nation states have a certain client status. And the global division of labor emerges in this new post-war order after the fall of Soviet Union. I don't think so. Soviet Union had fallen then. But, but this new order in which regimes and governments are not sovereign in themselves, but they align themselves with the United States and function within that regime of capital, that Europe and Britain and France also function within that, and that all remains unsaid. The trace of that imperial ideology that's at work, right? Also, what she's talking about in this section is, um, and that's the conclusion, is that Deleuze and Foucault, they talk about immigrants towards the end of that interview. And they talk about exploitation of immigrant workers, right? But they only become part, a subject of their discussion because they have entered the metropolitan space. The only time the global other of Europe enters the imagination and conversation of Foucault and Deleuze is when they are already there, right? Their rights within France, right? And they are equated with all the other people who cannot be represented because they can speak for themselves. But what she's saying is that what doesn't enter, what is what remains silenced in this conversation is the colonized other, the, the other who is still under the imperial regimes of power, works within global division of labor, is exploited labor, right? So there is no acknowledgement of this other elsewhere because they are imagining the European worker, the European French prisoner as the ultimate subaltern subject. So the conclusion to part two then, uh, if I read it carefully, right, is sometimes it seems as if the very brilliance of Foucault's analysis of the centuries of European imperialism produces a miniature version of that heterogeneous phenomena, management of space, but by doctors, development of administrations, but in asylums. This is a catalog of Foucault's work. The clinic, the asylum, the prison, the university, all seem to be screen allegories, right? That foreclose a reading of the broader narratives of imperialism. So at the end of this section, having discussed how one project of colonial epistemic violence was to create the colonized other as the other of Europe, right? How that was done through not just education, that she talks about the educational system, but also through law and codification of law. And she gives us the example of the codification of British law against Sati. And then that we all exist in this neo-imperial order implemented by United States with its power in which every state or some states have client status, right? And through Pierre McCary teaching us about how to read the silences of a text, things that a text does not acknowledge, but are constitutive parts of it, right? She reads then the interview as a disavowal, as a silencing of the very bruised knowledge that Foucault retrieves elsewhere. And that bruised, bruised knowledge is the significance of global division of labor. Within that, the space of the formerly colonized but still subjugated subaltern subject of the non-West. Inscribed within that also is a discussion of the acts of retrieval by the subaltern studies group of the narratives of subaltern groups and how their reading, even though essentialized, is closer 
to what could be more plausible because they are doing a materialistic reading of it and not a desire-based libidinal reading of the subaltern groups. Now from here, she's already kind of hinted at how she will theorize the subaltern itself and how she will read it. The purpose always being to answer the one question that is the title of the essay and that is, can the subaltern speak? And this was part three. I am pretty sure I missed a lot and maybe lost my way in the process, but I hope this is useful to you. I will come back in a few days with part four of this lecture. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, if you would like me to answer some things that I might have misread or not mentioned in my reading of part two of Spivak's essay, do let me know in the comment section and I will address those. Thank you so much for joining me in this perilous venture as I've called it and I will see you next time with my next lecture. Until then, thank you and peace and love.